Does he call it? Oh, oh does he call the dragon claw? What a call. And oh, but then we get the catch from the meta champ from Inadequance. <laughs> Hey everyone, we are back with another Caleb's Pro Tip Series video. If you haven't seen my other Caleb's Pro Tip Series videos, I will link them down below. I also have a playlist holding all the videos in the series. So be sure to check those out too if you find this very helpful. And today we're going to talk about charge attack priority. It's actually charge attack priority, not charge move priority. And I've been corrected on this on the official terminology. If you ever look here, TMs for your fast tms or charge tms that talks about changing the fast attack or charge attack not the charge move or the fast move so the new acronym is actually cap cap it's the same thing as what cmp or charge move priority is for those that don't know it's essentially when your two pokemon on both sides are throwing the charge move or charge attack i should say at the same exact time and it triggers a simultaneous charge charge attack in these situations the pokemon with higher attack stats will get their move off first and this is not 0 through 15 in terms of your attack ivs it's specifically the specific attack value for your pokemon i'll create a later video more on specifically this attack value and determining which pokemon wins charge attack priority over the other but overall, this is a strategy that a lot of top tier trainers use. What's really important to know is how to leverage charge attack priority to your benefit. So this is where this video dives in. It's not just explaining the basics of charge attack priority. It really shows the complexity of it. To start things off, I'm going to show you a battle I did in Go Battle League, utilizing all the basics and the mechanics of charge attack priority. Before we get into the battles, I want to give a big shout out and thank you to all my patrons who've been supporting my content creation. If you'd like private one-on-one -on -one coaching, scrims against me, some of my league guides and strategies ahead of time, or even tune into my live stream battles, feel free to sign up through the Patreon link down below. So looking at this specific battle, uh, it was in Ultra League. I'm going to play it on regular speed so we can really dive into the nitty gritty details of this specific matchup. So Shadow Nail Queen into Tentacruel. The most important thing about knowing charge attack priority is which Pokemon win charge attack priority and also which Pokemon, uh, what the counts are for specific moves. So I know the Tentacruel gets their Scald at the same time I get to my Earth Power. So I end up baiting with my Poison Fang. Most Tentacruel, especially in Ultra League, are not running Acid Spray, so it's pretty safe to say this is going to be a Scald, so Worthy Shield for sure. I do Shield, the Super Effective move, and then now they come in with Obscune. Uh, Obscune, I know it's five counters to the Night Slash, which is typically the move of choice that they're going to throw, and in all likelihood, they do lose Charge Attack priority to the Nino Queen. so I'm going to let that first Night Slash go. Nope. Oh, they do get a boost, so a little unfortunate, but it is what it is. And now I'm going to charge attack priority them on this Poison Fang again. So charge attack priority on the Tentacruel and now on the Obscure. I have more than enough energy for Earth Power and they boosted. So in my mind, I'm thinking there's a high chance they shield. So they do shield. Now they're down uh, both their shields. I am as well. Uh, they're still boosted, but these are resisted counter damage. So even double boosted, two attacks, uh, Sage increase on the buffs is not a big deal. I'm going to try to get as much energy as I can. Getting more energy typically is more useful. And so now we get to the Earth Power on Charge Attack Priority once again, and it is enough to take out the Obscure in one shot, which is absolutely huge. Because now I not only took out the Obscure and shields are down, I still have a bunch of energy on my Nidal Queen. Technical Premium has no energy on top of this. And here comes a Greninja. Yeah, super effective Water Shurikens, but because I have all the energy stored, you can see I barely get to it, but I get to this Earth Power, which is huge because essentially leveraging Charge Attack Priority in the Obstagoon and the Tentacle matchup really set me up for success. It allowed me to get as much energy as possible, and now we have the match we want. We avoid the um, both the Obstagoon and the Greninja on the Jelson, and we lock in the uh, Jelson, which is a hard counter to the Tentacruel in that matchup. Reviewing that specific matchup, there's a lot that can really be optimized if you're really, really good with your charge attack timings. In that first specific situation, I did charge attack priority against the Tentacruel, also throwing the bait move, right? So getting even more energy stored up after throwing the bait move, forcing the opponent to swap out because they know they're just going to get outpaced to that next Scald compared to my Earth Power is Obstagoon came in. And because they boosted, the high chance of the shield, able to grab that shield on top of that. Because the switch timer wasn't up, I knew they couldn't catch the for sure hard-hitting Earth Power. 
I built all the way up to it. They're debuffed. And we made the most off of that situation by charge attack priority again. Now, obviously, you can use charge attack priority plenty in Go Battle League, but you can use it in the official championship circuit as well. And this is where it really comes in handy, especially in the show six pick three formats. And I'm going to show you two examples. I'm going to show you one example of a really bad situation where you are not doing charge attack priority in the correct way. And I had permission from my friend Palmer's up to show this footage because I, I told him ahead of time, this is a good example of what not to do. So let's take a look at what not to do and we'll dive deeper into what mistakes were made. But here we go. It is my least favorite mirror matchup, the Galarian Stunfisk, where the baits matter 100% of the time, all the time. Yeah, I think I, I might be one of the world's worst Galarian Stunfisk players here because it's always when you go for the when you go for the big move, they shield. When you go for the rock slide, they decide to let it go, right? So here, it looks like Rambling Man's uh, Galarian Stunfisk is going to win the charge with priority. He's going to go for the Earthquake here. And we do grab the first shield from Polymers up. This is going to be a pretty explosive match for you because if these shields go away right now, we just saw a, we just saw a, a match where we had no shields at the very end, and Pokemon were getting taken out left and right. These are two men after my heart, both going immediately for the Earthquake. <laughs> this is round two, shield number two. We see an Earthquake and I think I, a Rock Slide. I think I saw Paul and Tappy, the Rock Slide right there. This is going to be a very interesting here. So we do eat the second Protect Shield, and, and Paul and is going to go for the Rock Slide now. Does Rambling Man think that this is an Earthquake? Oh no, no shield. It's a hard Nox life for Polymers up here. Rock Slide, oh. it is double resistant. It just does not do much damage. He's got to come up with something in order to come out of the rest of this matchup. A Rock Slide bait. Oh, going for the charge move tie. That's oh so unfortunate. The Earthquake coming through. This is going to be enough to knock out the Galarian Stunfisk. Oh no, and that is so much energy down the drain right here. And unfortunately for Polymers, without any shields, I mean, Rambling Man, I think he's pretty satisfied with the, with the current situation, able to get a, a, an additional Earthquake off, has the Protect Shield here, has the Sableye in the back to be able to answer his Metacham. And he, and I think he already knows from seeing the Psychic in the previous in the previous battle, he probably thinks there's there's probably not any real answers that uh, the Metachamp's going to be able to throw out. Oh, interesting. Coming in with the Lantern, actually, as opposed to the Sableye. Uh, Knowing that the Galarian Stunfisk is out of the way, it's a bit surprising because there could still be an Umbreon in the back, but maybe predicting that Polymer's Up would not bring an ABA weak to Metacham team. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe it's thought, well, it's interesting that it's staying in with the Lantern right now. I, I, Lantern is quite bulky as a Sableye, um, but there's really no moves that really that, that are going to threaten you. I, but it does look like Bombers is forced to swap out here, giving Rambling Man a complete information. I mean, in this matchup right here, we saw in the previous one, Sableye was able to come in, uh, throw the return, be able to take out this Lantern. That might be what he's going for, but, but yeah, there's, um, you know, knowing that you have a hard counter in Sableye, I don't think there's a reason not to bring it in there. Yeah, uh, we're going to go for the Surf Bait. I think this is a bit interesting because I don't think it's going to be quite enough to knock out. I think Polymer's Up is just trying to save as much energy as he can and go for a farm down afterwards. And it's actually going to pull out the Surf from Rambling Man. So he's able to survive this quite handily. This is resisted as opposed to neutral damage. And he's going to get a, a theoretical farm down. It does not happen. We go for another, another Surf Bait. I don't think it actually matters if Rambling Man shields here or not because one charge move is not enough to knock out. I think both of the trainers know that. We see a little bit of eye contact between them, a little bit of recognition that uh, the game is uh, looking for an end here. Yep, and then of course Metacham, although he had all that energy right there, is not going to be able to do too much. Save life. Just a hard Metacham counter right here. Let's do a deeper dive into this specific matchup and what went wrong right obviously we saw that there was a few charge attack priority situations especially in this mirror matchup so in this specific situation where we already know that palmer's up on the left his glaring stump is loses charge attack priority compared to ramblings man's glaring stump is on the right and we find this out in this specific instance right they are both throwing earthquake at the same exact time and in this situation now both players know it's going to be rambling man's glaring stump is that win charge attack priority so both trainers go for the harder hitting move and uh, i believe it gets shielded on both ends and so everything's fine right now makes sense and then here's where you have this information ready and your palmer's up you got to think 
So because he knows that he's about to, he's going to lose charge attack priority, it makes no sense for him to throw an earthquake again right when he gets it. Why? Because he knows that Rambling Man is likely going to go for that earthquake at the same time. It's a hard hitting move, super effective, and he already knows he has nothing to lose from it. Worst case scenario, Palmer's up catches earthquake on another Pokemon. So best case scenario, he could catch it on the Trevenant. Maybe a low nine deals, but theoretically Trevenant is probably the best answer because that's the only thing that resists it. But outside, but in that situation, if he does that, he gives up Switch of Mana. So um, either way, there's nothing really for Rambling Man to lose at throwing Earthquake at charge attack priority. For Palmer's up, he has no reason to throw at that time. Why? Because he already knows that Rambling Man has a very high likelihood of throwing Earthquake at that timing. Now, because of that, he should be over farming, especially because he knows he's going to lose charge attack priority unless he's going for a catch himself. And if, if he's staying in this matchup, right, if he tries to catch Earthquake on his Medicham, let's say, makes sense. But anything else, it just doesn't make sense for him to stay in and throw. Because he already knows he's not going to charge attack priority. He's going to spend a shield or get hit by a move before he gets his own move off. So what happens here is he does throw on charge attack priority. Now, he's actually going for the rock side bait. Ramble Man, it makes sense for him to go for the Earthquake. Why? Because he already knows that he wins charge attack priority. He has nothing to lose by throwing this Earthquake. Best case scenario, uh, worst case scenario for him, Palmer sub catches the uh, res uh, resistant earthquake on something else, but he ends up winning switch advantage. Rambler Man, that is. Palmer sub goes for the bait. And in this situation, it's a really great play by Rambler Man. He doesn't shield. Why? He already got two shields out of Palmer sub. He's in a good spot. And uh, there's really, like, even if he gets hit by earthquake, he's already up a shield, and Palmer sub has zero shields left. And looking at the backside of Palmer sub, Shield's completely down. Uh, it's not necessarily Rambler Man will win the game for sure, but he does have like at least even footing because he has a shield advantage, but could be a good situation depending on what Palmer's has in the back. Um, so now there's another Earthquake being thrown. Now, so here's the weird part. So Palmer's up technically can get to this Earthquake beforehand. Right? You see, he reaches it when Rambler Man gets to Rock Side. Why? Because Palmer's up threw a bait earlier. Now, instead of throwing... The earthquake when the rock side was reached on Rambleman's side, right? Because he would have gotten off before Rambleman gets the earthquake off. It doesn't matter if they charge attack priority on a rock side, on Rambleman's rock side, because that was going to do resist damage anyway. He instead throws the earthquake now, and this is probably a miscount on his end, when Rambleman gets to his third earthquake. Now, this is probably the worst case scenario of worst case scenarios. Why? Because you have all this energy stored. If you're Palmer's up, you actually have more energy stored than Rambleman because you had a bait earlier. Yes, you failed the bait, but that wasn't the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is this scenario. Failing the bait, spending additional shield, and then losing charge attack priority a third time on another earthquake from Rambleman. And so this is probably the worst case scenario of worst case scenarios, like I said, because Rambleman comes in with a hard of hitting, super effective earthquake, takes out Palmer's ups, clearing stuff is when he's at pretty much 100 energy. And from there, you can see from the rest of the game, it kind of just goes downhill. First mistake was not the charge attack. The first the charge attack priority. That was fine. The first mistake was charge attack priority on the second one. Because first and foremost, Palmer Sub shouldn't have thrown that move. Um, even if he was going for a rock side bait, he should have thrown that bait after the fact if he really wanted to. Right? But he should come away with extra energy. Because if he went for the Earthquake in this situation, it's still not the most ideal situation for him. Because he could have left with way more energy. He doesn't need to throw that Earthquake right away because he already knows he's not getting off first. He might as well take a few more Mudshot damage just to get his own Mudshot energy. Because Mudshot's not really doing anything in this mirror matchup. So first mistake is throwing on charge attack priority yet again. The baits, it's, you know, depends on your own play style if you think the baits worth worthy or not. But, um... But yeah, so that's that's just a really good call by Rambler Man not to shield the baits. And of course, the second and probably the worst mistake is going over the amount of energy he needed to get to Earthquake and throwing yet again on charge attack priority. What Palmer's up could have done to maybe come back from the situation is throw this Earthquake when Rambler Man is one much shot away from his own. Because he knows he's not going to charge attack priority anyway, so there's no need to throw when Rambler Man gets to his own Earthquake. But if you throw one before Rambler Man's Earthquake, you make the most of the situation. You either grab Rambler Man's final shield, and he gets his own Earthquake off, or you take Rambler Man out, and you still maximize the amount of energy you can have for yourself. Because if he throws at the very last second, he at least has some residual much shot. But as you can see, he went way too over, and that's pretty much the game from there. 
Now that we've seen an example of what not to do, I'm gonna showcase an example of really good charge attack priority. And it is going to be the Shadow Charge up, but met by the Glaring Stumpus. And this is tough. You can get in this matchup if you bait some Dragon Claws. And we've seen other trainers try. We've seen other trainers call the baits. And you have to absolutely protect shield these rock slides. It's double super effective into a Shadow Charizard. So now, what does an Adequence do? Does he go for it? Does he go for the winning plays or does he try to go for the Dragon Claw bait? El Shea has been playing out of his mind. Does he call it? Oh, oh does he call goodness. the Dragon Claw? What a call. And oh, but then we get the catch from the Meta Champ from Inadequance. That was brilliant from both trainers. I think El Shea has a slight advantage there in that situation because yes, now Oh, but this does bait out the knockdown. This is pretty smart from Inadequance, swapping out the Metachamp to ensure the knockdown matchup. So his Shadow Venusaur is a lot safer down the stretch. It is definitely safer, but Inadequance, let's not forget, is down a shield. And nothing really appreciates coming into this knockdown. Inadequance did not bring Glare Stumpus nor Gunsmarsh, nor Lantern in this matchup, and Noctowl is coming to play now in game number two, surprising an inadequance in this team composition. Metacham goes down, gets knocked out, and how do you finish up this Noctowl? Inadequance is holding his head because he has two Shadow types in the back, and he doesn't want to soak any of this energy. He throws on charge attack priority, once again baiting with the Dragon Claw, and if El Shea calls this once again, he might endure. No, he protects shield just to ensure the Sky Attack. But still, ensuring to get the Sky Attack off is going to be huge. Getting this final shield from Inadequance. This Galarian Sunfish looks really good in the back end, especially down shields. And here it comes in. Charizard trying to get to that Blast Burn. Is going to throw this time. Do you make the shield? And El Shea making the correct shield call. Recognizing that this Galarian Sunfish has so much play, especially because Medicham is already taken out. Galarian Sunfish has played into everything. El Shea is good. He always knows how to make the right plays here, even with five Pokemon. Getting to this Earthquake. I don't think this Earthquake does knock out, but this Galarian Sunfish is loaded on energy. The Earthquake is going to land into the Shadow Venusaur. The Shadow Venusaur endures. Can get to the Frenzy Plant, but it uh, looks like El Shea is not tapping. Is trying to leave the Venusaur with health to try to get some energy advantage. So we saw the undercharge at game number one, and then the not, the pause and tapping game number two. Yeah, I like this way from El Shea because the Charizard is going to take out the Metacham if it doesn't have energy. You can tank a Frenzy Plant, no problem. You want as much energy as possible on this Medicham. Medicham is going to come in. Wow. Oh, gets the counter down before the Frenzy Plant's even reached. Wow, precise. El Shea is amazing here. Now, Inadequance reaching for the Blast Burn. Oh, catching the, the Blast, Blast Burn! Burn. Oh, the knockdown. What a huge catch. El Shea playing out of his mind in this winner's bracket. And here he comes with the Psyche out Medicham. 2-0 against Inadequance with only five Pokemon! Ridiculous plays from El Shea to take this series 2-0 to, to move on into the winner's semis. The face was dodge! A deeper analysis into this matchup, right? Two world's competitors, very, very strong battlers, and we can see how complex the mind games can go. So right here, you can see El Shea throws this first rock side. And he throws this rock side when Inadequance is one away from that Blast Burn. Why? Because now he knows that he's not going to charge attack priority. So he makes the most out of the situation. He also throws rock side after six mud shots instead of five. Not only to maximize the amount energy he can hold on to before throwing it, but also because he knows that Inadequance knows Glenn Stumpfist takes only five mud shots to get to rock side. In that situation, if Inadequance want to try to catch the rock side instead with something else, it makes it harder to pre predict when El Chase is going to throw. If he throws right when he gets the rock side, then Inadequance could catch that rock side on, let's say, a Medicham for resisted right away. But because El Chase is throwing not at maybe the, you know, exact timing when he gets that rock side, it makes it a little bit hard to predict, right? So already thinking right off the bat on the first charge move uh, in a situation where he's trying to maximize. In this situation too, you can see Inadequance actually does something similar. So he throws a Dragon Claw bait, right? He has enough for Blast Burn. But if you look very carefully, similar to what El Che did, he threw right before El Che got to the Rock Side. So let's just rewind it real quick so you can see it. You can see he throws right before the Rock Side's reach. So this is not Charge Attack Priority. Again, 
obviously this video on charge attack priority so why is this really important because you have to understand charge attack priority to know why they're doing what they're doing inadequance is going to throw before charge attack priority and you're thinking okay he is running a shadow charizard why wouldn't you throw on charge attack priority you're going to win over glenn stumpfist the reason being is if he throws before charge attack priority he is not locked into el chase rock side if el chase throws on the rock side at the same time inadequance does right so if inadequance threw one uh wing attack later and they go on charge attack priority all lj has to do is shield one blast burn and then he gets off or potential blast burn and gets off a of rock side another move that inadequance has a shield because after that at that point in time inadequance will be down two shields right off the bat but instead inadequance throws this dragon call a very smart decision before charge attack priorities up and the reason being, and you can see right here is why. So obviously Elche makes an incredible call, chooses not to shield. But Inadequance knows that he's at the rock side now. And if he stays in for another move, he just gets taken out. So he actually makes an incredible play of catching the move on the Medicham. Had he thrown on charge attack priority the previous dragon call against Glenn Stumpfus, he can't do that, right? Because he's stuck into that rock side. But because he threw it right before, he knew that Elche had not pressed the rock side yet. He would have to press it on the next turn. So because of that, he ends up catching the resisted rock side on his mansion. So fantastic um, counterplay by Inadequance after the no shield call from Elche. And looking specifically here, you can see Elche throws this sky attack right before Inadequance gets to Ice Punch. I think he was pretty much at 100 energy at that point too, but he throws it to avoid any charge attack priority situations. Sometimes uh, Noctowl can win charge attack priority, I guess, but uh, for the most part, um, Medicham is going with that situation. So you don't really want to gamble. And so in this situation, it's kind of interesting. So uh, El Che goes for another wing attack, right? And possibly it's because he wasn't sure what was coming in. He didn't want to go for a catch. I don't know. So that's a kind of a trickier situation. But Inadequance threw another wing attack before getting to the Blast Burn. So sometimes these situations happen where you see two trainers, both super experienced kind of trying to predict each other's catches, right? At this point, you know both of them know their counts. There's been catches already. Um, timer's not really up, though. So I guess LJ in this specific situation, if we want to be really nitpicky, could just throw the Sky Attack before Inadequance gets uh, to the Blast Burn. Dragon Call probably would. It's close to KOing, but I don't think it does. So LJ could just throw that. But both opt to go for a one additional wing attack for whatever reason, and then Inadequance throws... Uh, before this guy attack is thrown, which is um interesting play. Um, but he does get a shield from Elche, which is pretty nice. So, gets another shield from Elche, and you can see Elche is going to charge attack priority on the sky attack. And in this situation, Inakwins has to burn his final shield because he has, if he is running back, and that's going to just do way too much damage to a Charizard. And now Elche comes in with a Glaring Stunfist. Uh, he does have the energy ready. Or he does have a shield uh, ready, so he's going to shield up right away. Uh, because he knows he gets to rock side before Inadequance gets to another Blast Burn, even if he went for the Dragon Claw bait. And in this situation, I believe the Venusaur comes out, and uh, we get an Earthquake thrown. Uh, this er Earthquake's thrown at this timing, really, because El Chase is already at 100 NG. I guess he could have thrown a little bit more much out, but it just makes no sense to go for any additional ones. And that's a hard-hitting move. Um... Very solid. And they see uh, this is actually a very advanced technique as well. Um, both trainers choosing not to do much uh, because he did not, El Che did not want, um, he wanted to be able to farm more health off of Inadequence's Venusaur. Uh, so that's why he chose not to throw as many much shots, even though he could have. Uh, because in this situation, he wants more energy on the Medicham. And so here, uh, he's going to wait out his timer. And then so that he can make a catch later, he gets the counter through right before Inadequence gets to a friend's plan. So he gets um, some farm. And on top of that, uh, avoids the friend's plan. And this is a very huge play. And you can see it's, uh, it's obviously a really great catch. But here's what's important to know. If you look at the energy on Anakin's side, he's already at the blast burn. Right here. But he doesn't throw. Why? Because he decides to throw when Elche gets to the Psychic. Uh, Psychics are going to be a way harder hitting move. There's a small chance he he survives the Ice Punch, but he purposely tries to maximize the energy he can get because he wants some extra energy for this knockdown in the back. Now, here's the ridiculous play from El, El Che. Is instead of swapping when Inadequence had the Blast Burn, 
he decides to swap when he gets to the Psychic. Why that's a really incredible play is because Elche is capitalizing on the fact that Inadequance knows that his uh, Inadequance knows his own counts and knows that Inadequance is going to try to maximize on that situation. So this is where the mind gets the charge attack priority really comes in. When you have two very skilled players that both know each other and both know that the, their respective opponents know their move counts and charge attack priority and how all that works, there's a lot of respect shown to each side. But because of that, you can also take advantage of the fact that you know your opponent is very knowledgeable and also knows the, similar, the same mechanics that you do. And so because of that, El Che is gambling on the fact that Inadequance is going to throw this Blast Burn when he gets to the Psychic, rather than when he gets to an Ice Bunch. Now, if you think about it this way, if Inadequance did not throw, right, the Blast Burn when he got to the Psychic, then, you know, then he just farms up extra energy against the Noctowl, throws a Dragon Call, then throws a Blast Burn, takes out the Medjam on Charge Attack Priority. But, but El Che knows that that's the play he's going to make, because if he doesn't make the play, he throws a Psychic and it's game over too. So there's a lot of mind games. The, the winning condition for inadequance in this scenario is actually not throwing the Blast Burn when the Magium got to Psychic. Because he knows that El Che knows that he knows this, that he's going to try to optimize as much energy as possible. It, and so at that point, there's so many mind games going on. You just have to predict at what level your opponent is. But this example is a really great example where it shows that two very talented trainers can really capitalize on charge attack priority its principles and really how to make the most of it in this really good example of charge attack priority there's a lot of very deep understanding of how the game works and all the counts from both players really and so even though inadequance lost that specific battle he also employed a lot of really good strategy in strategies in that specific matchup to showcase his understanding of the concepts and how to leverage it to his own benefit. And a lot of El Che's success really relied on him expecting inadequance to know his counts and charge attack priority mechanics on top of it. And so really sometimes it's about knowing the opposing player and playing to their skill level. Overall, charge attack priority is more than just knowing the counts of your moves. It's really understanding the various layers behind it and when it's important to go for it, when it's not to, and when to throw before charge attack priority even happens etc etc and really the better you get at it and the better your opponent gets at it the better the mind games are and that's what makes pokemon go really exciting thank you all for watching if you liked this video and found it helpful please give it a like and share especially to those that also are struggling with charge attack priority or understanding some of the deeper concepts behind it for more content like this be sure to subscribe hit that notification bell to get alerted right when i post a new video and i'll catch you all next time